Glenn, you and I are both wearing purple shirts here. What's going on? It's purple day. There you go. All right, we're just, we're just waiting for one more member of FedCo to join us. <clears throat> All right. Hello, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the Finance and Economic Development Committee meeting for the 3rd of May, pour le 3 May 2022. Uh, do we have quorum, Madam Coordinator? Yes, we do, Mr. Chair. Okay, so uh, everyone, I don't think I have to go through the reminders of you know, don't put your uh, phone on uh, hold and so on. We'll do a quick roll call. Councillor Cloutier. Présent, Monsieur le Maire. Councillor Curry. Here. Councillor DeRouz. Here, hey, Monsieur le Maire. Councillor Alshantiri. Present. Councillor Gower. Here. Councillor Hubley. Here. Councillor Luloff. Present. Councillor Moffat. Councillor Tierney. Present. And Vice Chair Dudas. And uh, the Vice Chair has sent her regrets. Declaration of interest, Declaration uh, d'intérêt. None. Confirmation meeting, adoption de process verbal pour le 5 avril 2022. Carried. 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 Uh, finance Carried. services, the Ottawa Hospital Civic Campus Plan. We'll come back to that. We have a presentation. Uh, community and social services, service socio et communitaire, OCH, uh, redirect Ottawa Community Housing Corporation's property tax savings and update on CMHC uh, investment loan to Ottawa Community Housing. This is a standard. We do this every year, I think, Wendy. Not mistaken. Oh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Actually, we've done this um, two years in a row. I believe this is the third. It's really just helping uh, OCH with respect to uh, their debt servicing and reallocating some funds to help with some of the COVID impacts that they've seen over the last couple of years. Okay. Uh, on the report, Carrie? Carrie. Carrie. Designating affordable housing projects at 92 Florence and 255 and 256 St. Denis Street as municipal capital housing facilities exempt from property taxes and exempt extending the municipal capital facility designation of Ottawa Community Housing's corporate corporate head office at 39 Ar Aruga Drive. Gary? Gary. Uh, Finance uh, Services Conservation Authorities 2022 levies. Gary? Gary. Gary. Uh, Innovative Client Services Community Partners Insurance Program. We have one delegation. Yeah, hold. Uh, item uh, Office of the City Clerk status update Fedco motions received. 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 Planning, real estate, and economic development. I know this is something Councillor Gower is very excited to see, as am I, because I, I thought it, it, it we we lined it up a couple of years ago. But thank you, Councillor Gower, for your persistence. The acquisition of part of Shea Road Woods. Do you want to say anything, Councillor, on this? Because I know you've worked. At, to get this to this stage and we thank you for that. Well, I would, this is a, a very important green space and recreation space for Stittsville residents and many people who live around the Stittsville area as well. And I just quickly like to thank uh, Derek Moody and, and the real estate uh, in Creo and his colleagues for their dogged determ determination to bring this to the finish line. Uh, what they have um, uh, negotiated with the property owner is a very good deal for taxpayers. Also, I'd like to thank previous councillors Shad Kadri and Janet Stavinga. I believe it was actually Janet who first uh, put this on the radar of the city as a potential acquisition. And here we are many years later and, and finally with a solid agreement for purchase. So thank you to everyone who's had a role in this over the past several years. Great. Well, well done. Uh, on the motion, carried. Uh, Brownfield grant application 115 Champaign Avenue South. Carried. Carried. Uh, Brownfield grant, grant application 1040 Somerset Street West. Carried. Carried. Uh, is Councillor Moffat um, on yet? 
Council, you have a uh, an item that you want it uh, waived on. Are you prepared to do that now? Yes, that's right. I'm so, do that right now. Um, on um, waiving of the uh, waiving the item on the agenda, carried. Carried. Councillor, but if you'd like to introduce the motion. Uh, thank you. So it's uh, it's the Better Homes Loan Auto Program, which is incredibly popular. So we need to make some adjustments to account for its popularity. Uh, so whereas in January 2020, Council approved climate change master plan, which set a target to reduce community greenhouse gas emissions 100% by 2050. And whereas in October 2020, Council approved energy evolution, Ottawa's Korean energy transition and energy transition strategy, which identified the deep energy retrofits of 98% of all buildings, residential buildings would be needed to meet this GHG target. And whereas in July 2021, Council approved the launch of the Better Homes Ottawa Loan Program with a $4.1 million grant, along with an $8.1 million loan at 0% percent interest from FCM and a $3.8 million loan from Van City Investment Bank at 3.25% interest. And whereas the program uptake has been successful and much higher than expected since it launched in November 2021, with over 600 applications from homeowners, totaling an estimated $25 million in loan requests and approximately 10 new applications per week. And whereas under the new service current the, the sorry, whereas under the current service agreement with Enviro Center, the program could be extended if additional loan capital to meet the demands of the program is able to be secured and whereas the government of Canada bond rates are expected to increase again on June 1st 2022 which would increase the borrowing rates for new loans and whereas obtaining the next tranche of loan capital prior to June 2022 would ensure lower interest rates can be offered to homeowners and whereas there are several options for recapitalization of the program through the various financing tools available to the city primarily cash to venture and private lenders and where our staff aim to employ the most cost-effective financing tool based on market conditions at the time of borrowing in order to meet the projected demand of the program, and where our staff reports back to council annually on all borrowings and rates achieved, and whereas loans through this program are secured by a cost recovery mechanism through priority liens on properties via the local improvement charge mechanism, thereby minimizing potential financial risk to the city, and where our staff will continue to report back to Council with a program evaluation report, therefore be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee recommend that Council direct staff to implement an additional $30 million in loan capital for the Better Homes Ottawa Loan Program by way of debentures, capital financing, or other allowable financial financing options pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001, based on whichever option represents the most cost-effective method available at the time of borrowing to be repaid by property owners and that the Chief Financial Officer Treasurer be authorized to execute any agreements to implement the additional program capital. Thank you. And I know Wendy Stephens is here if there's any questions on it. Any questions uh, to staff or the mover? Councillor Menard? Well, uh, no questions. I just wanted to say thank you to the mover and thank you to staff who've really done a great job unveiling this program. Uh, they've run pilot pro pro programs uh, within some communities. The uptake's been fantastic. And uh, this is something that works really well because it's a uh, minimal uh, cost, of course, but also uh, retrofits represent one of the things we need to move fast on when it comes to, to climate change. Uh, our building emissions are uh, one of the biggest contributors um, so to our, to our greenhouse gases and then transportation, of course, is up there. So great program. And, and I just thank the mover for it and also staff for all their work on, on this program and getting un unveiled. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Harder, please. Thank you, Mayor. I, um, I'm commenting because I've had uh, initially in this program a couple of complaints from people um, that uh, caused me to speak with uh, Don Herwire about the um, level of staffing that Enviro Centre had uh, put towards uh, this program, which was, as you said, um, extremely, as uh, Councillor Moffat said, extremely uh, successful. I just want to ask uh, staff, are you confident now that they have the um, proper staff component um, signed up to this very important project? It's, uh, <clears throat> it's Janice Ashworth here. I'll uh, take a crack at answering that question. Um, I've been the one managing the, or responsible for designing the program and because of the early uptake that was higher than expected, staff took a little, at, at Enviro Center, who's our delivery agent, took some time to get um, staffed up themselves to meet the level of demand, the, the higher level of demand than, than we had predicted, but 
but now they have developed systems and have brought on staff in order to meet <coughs> the new expectation. And the, uh, the the intake rate has also leveled off to a point of, of um, what that's manageable. So yes, I'm confident. That's good because it um, was clear that with just one person assigned to it, um, it wasn't uh, sufficient. And I, and I even wondered about the due diligence on the cho choosing of the uh, winning projects, if you will. So that's really good news to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor. So on uh, the motion, carry, adopt a. Carry. Yes. Okay, our first item uh, that uh, we have delegations for is the Ottawa Hospital Civic Campus Financial Framework, local share contribution. Uh, we'll have a staff presentation uh, by our treasurer and then um, Roger Greenberg, uh, the chair of the fundraising campaign and Cameron Love, the president of the hospital will speak. Uh, and then um, we will open it up for uh, questions and comments. So Ms. Stephenson, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Maire, et uh, bon matin, bon matin uh, to the members of the committee. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and good morning, committee members. I'm here this morning to provide a brief presentation on the report before committee today regarding the municipal local share for the new civic campus. Je suis ici ce matin pour faire une présentation de la contribution de la part locale. Uh, my colleague, Cyril Rogers, joins me this morning. And as the mayor said, uh, Roger Greenberg is here, who's heading up the fundraising campaign, as well as Cameron Love, the CEO of the hospital. Prochain uh, diapo, s'il plaît, Carol. In terms of background, uh, as I mentioned, we're here today to provide an update on the municipal local share asked for the new civic campus. And the report lays out the request um, of up to 150 million as a one-time ask from the Ottawa Hospital for the new civic campus. The report advises committee and council of the ask and seeks direction to review and report back on a funding strategy for options for the local municipal share. The report also outlines a financial framework as well as guiding principles that would direct staff in the work to be done. And finally, the report outlines a unique option as a result of the project and the local share ask for a special area development charge, which is very specific to the hospital site as an option for review. Prochain diapo, s'il plaît, Carol. So the overall construction budget for the new Civic Hospital is approximately $2.8 billion, and the province has committed $2.1 billion to the construction costs, leaving the total local share contribution at $700 million. And the local share can be comprised of several components, including uh, the hospital foundation fundraising campaign, things like in-kind contributions that could come from local businesses who are working on the project, federal contributions, and municipal funding. In terms of the municipal local share, the hospital has made an ask uh, for $150 million contribution, and that's approximately 5.4% of the overall construction budget. And there's no legislative or prescribed requirement for a municipal local share contribution, but we are bringing this forward to committee and council um, for uh, consideration. And any of that contribution would be made at substantial completion, which is in 2028. So there's four recommendations in the report, and I'm going to walk through each of one of them at a very high level this morning. So the first one um, is really just uh, seeking to advise committee and council on the receipt of the one time municipal local share request. As we move through the planning process for the master site and the parking garage, um, we always said that we would bring uh, forward a request for the local share uh, to council when we received it. And that's exactly what we're doing today. In terms of the second recommendation in the report, um, it, it seeks direction um, from committee and council for staff to review and report back on options for the municipal local share early in the next term of council. So staff would expect to report back in quarter two or quarter three of 2023 with options. And we work closely with our colleagues at the Ottawa Hospital um, for funding strategies. 
in terms of the third recommendation in the report. It sets out a financial framework and guiding principles should Council approve the review of the local share request. And I'll walk through them in a future slide to explain how they're going to guide our work uh, should the report uh, recommendations be approved. And the last recommendation directs staff to review a very unique option and opportunity. Uh, which is a special area development charge, which is specific to the hospital site. Uh, and it includes a review of the required uh, growth related offsite capital works that are associated um, with the project, looking at the associated costs of those works and bringing back a background study and amending bylaw to impose such a charge. And today the hospital is exempt from paying development charges, sort of saving except for the transit portion. And there's no recognition of this in the local share. And the city doesn't get any credit for that as it stands today. So what we're proposing to do is review this. And this option would see approximately 90% of those costs being funded by the province. So very similar to as it is today and 10% of the costs uh, funded by the city. And that would actually go towards the local share. The special area development charge would be exclusive to the hospital site, so it wouldn't impact, impact any of the development that's occurring outside of it, and it would facilitate the need for future service, so those off-site works um, give a couple of examples. So the turning lanes, the boulevard improvements, uh, perhaps some beautification, and potentially the LRT connectivity that are required for the new campus and the site plan. Prochain diapo, s'il plaît, Carol. So staff have recommended a financial framework and four guiding principles to complete the review for the local share ask. They are outlined in the report and I wanna walk through each one of them this morning. So the first seeks to minimize the burden on Ottawa taxpayers such that there would be a minimal or no financial burden to them. This guiding principle ensures that the city maintains the council approved tax increase and ensures value for investments with consideration of the local economy and the community as a whole. It also ensures that the city lives within its means with predictable tax increases, and it doesn't put a financial burden on the taxpayers. A tax levy is an option at council's will, and staff would really like to do the harder work uh, to find options that are outside of this. The second guiding principle has no redirection of existing or committing, committed operating or capital budget dollars, as this would put pressures on uh, existing delivery of our services, as well as the commitments that we've made through our various long range financial plans, including our council priorities. If there were a redirection of these dollars, there would be pressures that we'd have to uh, address. This also helps maintain the city's credit rating and its overall financial sustainability. So here we're really looking for new sources to be able to fund the local share. In terms of the uh, third guiding principle, it would support exploration of one time or very unique financial options that are either time specific or context precise. And they could be exclusive to the hospital partnership or the hospital site development. And this guiding principle is gonna direct staff to explore unique specific and context precise financial strategies and options related uh, that really leverage our relationship with TOH and could be a potential solution for the local share. And the final guiding principle is to support the city's climate change goals and community sustainability. The city's climate change action plan aims to take unprecedented collective action to transition Ottawa into a clean, renewable and resilient city by 2050. We need the help of our community to achieve the council adopted GHG reduction targets of which we've based on the 2020 2012 uh, levels by 100% uh, in the community by 2050. And the new Civic Hospital will contribute to the community goal of lowering GHGs with its uh, LEED Silver certification. So here we're really trying to tie any potential investment to advance the climate change uh, initiatives and goals within our community. So we've done a, a comprehensive environmental scan of municipalities across Ontario to outline local share options. And most municipalities contribute through a tax levy. So whether it's a tax and save 
uh, for the municipal share contribution or at substantial completion through a debenture issuance uh, where they fund that debenture through an annual tax levy, uh, raising enough funds basically to debt service it annually over its life. Some municipalities have done a contribution through use of their reserve funds as a one-time contribution, whereas others have also contributed capital works. Uh, there's a very unique solution in the town of Oakville. They made a one-time contribution through the sale of their uh, Hydro's uh, telecom arm. I think it was about $40 million. And they also issued debt, uh, which, which I believe was around $90 million, um, which is paid through incremental um, annual Hydro dividends that they received. The local share contribution in terms of the overall percentage um, of the project uh, is uh, very similar um, from other municipality to municipality in terms of the benchmarking that we've done. And the request that we've received from the Ottawa Hospital falls in line with the others. So today in summary, uh, we're here to ask committee to receive the ask, to direct staff to review and report back on the options for the local share using the financial framework and the guiding principles that we've laid out here, and to review unique solutions um, and that special area development charge that I mentioned earlier. I'm now gonna pass it over uh, to Roger Greenberg and Cameron Love, who are gonna speak to the fundraising efforts in our community, as well as provide an overview of the project and the municipal ask. Great, thank you very much. So uh, I think we have um, Cam and Roger coming up. I am on, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you can see me and hear me. I can see and hear you, Roger. And is Cameron? I'm hoping. With us? I'd hate to, I'd hate to be flying solo on this myself this morning. But, uh, good, morning. good morning, Mr. Mayor. Can you, you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear and see you. Thank you both. Just before um, you begin, I just wanted to uh, publicly thank you, Roger, for your family's very generous donation of $25 million to the Ottawa Hospital campaign. Um, as they say, you're putting your money where your mouth is, you're chairing it, and you're also contributing it. So uh, thank you for that very kind gesture. And uh, I know it will send a signal out to others in the community to be as generous as possible for this very exciting city building project. So I think, uh, Roger, you're going to speak first, and then Cameron, the floor is yes. yours. Yep. Well, thank you very much for those kind words, Mr. Mayor, and uh, good morning to you and to uh, your fellow FEDCO committee members. Uh, thank you for allowing Cameron and I to speak to you today about this matter, one which I believe from, you can see from the mayor's words, which one is of the utmost importance to the future of our city and its residents. I also wanna thank city staff who prepared the report that uh, Wendy has just uh, reviewed with you. I'm here today as chair of the Ottawa Hospital Foundation's $500 million fundraising campaign for the new civic. As most of you know, I'm a lifelong resident of Ottawa whose family has had a long connection with TOH and we are longtime supporters uh, of the hospital as well. I am extremely proud to be leading the community's fundraising efforts for this new hospital. After working quietly behind the scenes for more than three years, we publicly launched our fundraising campaign a few weeks ago, and we are already close to achieving the midpoint in our campaign with many more prospects yet to be seen. People are giving enthusiastically to build our new hospital, I hope that this committee shares that enthusiasm and supports us as we pursue our ambition to provide the citizens of Ottawa with the very best health care available anywhere in the world. Our community and this city have a long history of supporting and contributing to ensure our health care needs. Almost 100 years ago, it was then Mayor Harold Fisher who had a dream of a new hospital for the city of Ottawa. Under his watch, the city paid $70,000 for the farmland where the Civic was built and where it still stands today. Since the original Civic was originally opened in 1924, all of our local hospitals have benefited from municipal support. The Ottawa Hospital's Riverside campus, for example, was built on city donated land. This is the first new acute care hospital to be built in our community since 1980. I will point out that at the beginning of this century, hospitals in our community underwent several large scale redevelopment and expansions that were supported by the city. So this means that this is the first request in over 20 years to the city to support the new hospital. 
Mr. Mayor, council members of FEDCO, we need this new hospital. This existing civic is 100 years old and simply cannot meet the needs of our growing population, especially during the pandemic. The hospital administration is anxious to roll up its sleeves and work with the city's administration to get this hospital built for our community and for generations to come. I know that working together, the Ottawa Hospital and the city can come up with a proposal that will allow for a contribution of $150 million on behalf of all citizens and businesses of Ottawa. I will now turn the balance of the presentation over to Cam, who will provide you with more detail. And thank you for your time. I do apologize that I'm not going to be able to stay on long uh, on this call because uh, I have a previous commitment, but I will wait uh, through Cam's presentation and to answer any questions that committee members may have. Thank you. Cam? Yeah. Great. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Roger, and thank you, Mayor Watson and committee members for having us here this morning. Uh, I want to start by thanking the city staff for their ongoing work throughout the life of this project and for the development of this report. Uh, that the Ottawa Hospital fully supports and is committed to continuing to work closely with the City of Ottawa as we move forward with the development of this new hospital. As Roger mentioned, the Ottawa Civic Hospital opened almost 100 years ago, and it really was at that time a visionary response to the 1918 flu pandemic. Ironically, today's COVID-19 pandemic has underscored once again the importance of state-of-the-art health care, which is why we are so excited to be building an extraordinary new hospital to replace the outdated confines of this existing campus. We invite you to join us in looking forward with pride and hope to what will be a stunning world-class facility, one that will provide Ottawa citizens from all of our diverse communities, as well as patients from across Eastern Ontario, Western Quebec, and Nunavut, with the best in class care throughout the 21st century. Uh, um, when it opens in 2028, in addition to providing unmatched patient care, our new campus will be a hub for innovation, discovery, and learning. It'll be where great medical minds will tackle the biggest challenges in healthcare and most likely solve them. It will house one of the most innovative neuroscience research programs, a world-class trauma center, and advanced medical and surgical infrastructure to rival any across Canada and most likely across the world. This new hospital will be built for the future with cutting edge health technologies, as well as built-in flexibility and resiliency to support our community through changes to our population, our climate, and even future pandemics. The new, the new hospital will also, be, will also spearhead the Ottawa Hospital's effort to fight the climate emergency and move very much towards a net zero energy status. Our, our new hospital will also bring significant economic impact to this community and to this city. We will continue to be the second largest employer in the region after the federal government. And the construction of this facility will generate an additional 4,000 full-time equivalent jobs each year, inject over 2 billion annually into the local economy and contribute more than 1.25 billion to the Ottawa's labor, to Ottawa's labor income. And that is all in addition to the 20,000 jobs that are gonna be created during construction. Uh, slide two, please. Perfect, thank you. So now let's talk about funding. Uh, so the federal government provided us with a 50 acre site where the new hospital will be built. The province of Ontario will contribute over 2.1 billion to the new hospital, equal to 90% of the project's construction costs. And our local share is 700 million. As Roger has mentioned, we are committed to fundraising 500 million for this project. And we expect to generate another 50 million through retail and other revenues, which leaves 150 million which is our ask to the city today. We believe that given the extraordinary importance of our new hospital to the health of each and every Ottawa citizen, to our parents, our children, and our grandchildren, that the city of Ottawa has an obligation to ensure that all of our loved ones receive the best health care possible and to join TOH and the province and the federal governments in investing in our future. We are 100% committed to working with the city over the next year on a plan to achieve this 150 million. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see from this slide, other municipalities across Ontario have contributed significant funding in support of new hospitals being built in their communities for their citizens. The Ottawa Hospital knows that this city cares for its citizens every bit as much as those councils care for theirs. And so today we respectfully ask you to commit to helping us build this extraordinary new healthcare facility for all of Ottawa citizens for generations to come. Thank you for your time this morning.
All right, thank you very much, Cam and Roger. So uh, now uh, questions and comments uh, to either staff or our colleagues from the hospital. We'll be the first. Uh, Councillor Gower from Stittsville. So, thank, thank you. So to be clear, we can ask to staff or to uh, uh, Mr. Greenberg or Mr. Love at this time? That's correct. Okay, um, maybe I'll start with staff then. Um, thank you, Wendy, for the presentation. I just wanna be really clear. We are receiving this request right now. Procedurally, we are not seeing yet, we are not saying yes. We are just acknowledging that the hospital has asked us for a $150 million contribution and we're acknowledging we've received it. Is that what we're, we're going to be uh, voting on today? That's correct. You're receiving the request, Councillor. Um, and then if you look at the remainder of the recommendations, we're seeking direction. Would you like us to look at this? And we will report back in the next term of council. And you've identified a number of creative financing solutions. I think some of them look promising. Um, is that an exhaustive list? If there are recommendations that come up from council or from the community in the interim on other creative ways to for the city to contribute to this, are you open to exploring those? Yeah, thanks very much uh, for that question, Councillor, and the opportunity to expand on that. So we, we have some ideas. They are by no means exhaustive. Um, so absolutely open to any ideas you would like to share with us. We will take those away. And that's really the point of us doing this review and reporting back is to make sure that we've gone through everything we possibly come uh, can and come back um, to committee and council with those recommendations to say, here's how we can fulfill the request for the local share. Okay. Um, have we had any other requests from other hospitals in the region? Uh, I know there's a number of hospitals that have near term or um, you know, medium term plans for expansion or renovations. What's the status of any other requests? Yeah, I've not received any other requests, Councillor, um, but I will take you back in terms of a little bit of history, if that is okay. Uh, we have said in the report that the city has, has not traditionally and has not um, provided a local share request. And I, I say that in the terms of the new city, so post amalgamation. However, um, if we go back to, I'm going to say the former city of Nepean, there were some reserve funds um, that were left, sort of what I call legacy funds. And so a decision was made um, to provide, I think it was a $2 million contribution, I believe in 2002 or 2003 to the Queensway Carlton for equipment. So it was a post amalgamation decision, but it was made with pre amalgamation money, if that's not confusing. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question for Wendy or a question for the hospital team, but are there any other provinces that require a local share contribution or is this unique to Ontario? Do you want me to answer that, Wendy? Yes, I would appreciate that. Thank yeah. you, Cameron. Um, thanks for the question, Councillor Gower. I, I can't be, uh, I'm not completely um, fully up to speed on what every single province does within every jurisdiction, but other provinces, um, I know of some hospitals that have local share requirements with their government. The, the nuances of how those governments structure capital plans, whether they'll fund for equipment, whether they don't fund equipment, whether they fund research, whether they don't fund research, they're all different nuances across every jurisdiction within provinces and across all provinces. But generally, uh, there is typically a, a foundation, a local count contribution, uh, and many municipalities I know have contributed over time. I think the most recent one, and we'd have to do some further looking into this, but the most recent one is what's happened out in Alberta. Uh, but we'd, I would have to get confirmation on specifics, but it is not uncommon at all across uh, the country. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so $50 million, sorry, $500 million targeting for fundraising. That does seem like a, a huge amount. So um, can you put that in context of some other, let's look at Ontario or other major cities in, in Canada. Where, where does that fall in? Um, I'm just trying to, the, the number alone, $500 million doesn't, doesn't mean a lot. So I'm looking for some more context as to similar campaigns and some of the different activities that were successful in arriving at such a big amount. I can answer that just a, a little bit, Councillor. I know that uh, certainly $500 million is by far the largest campaign in this city's history, um, especially for obviously for, for, for health care. 
um, you have on the chart that was provided by both Cameron and by Wendy what other campaigns have done recently in in uh, in in Ontario and the size of our bill at 2.8 billion dollars it's is what requires it to be such a large amount for local share it's much larger than most of the other hospitals which have 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 been built uh, over the last say 10 or 15 years I can tell you that the funding formula for uh, your question is one which is um, one which I, 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 I receive fairly consistently on the uh, fundraising trail when people say, why is this not funded 100% uh, by the province? And, and I, I can't give an answer why other than to say it is what it is. And this is the way it's been for more than 50 years. And our, our, our situation is very simple. We either raise the local share or the province drops us down to the bottom of the list. There's nine other hospitals that are on this list uh, and uh, we'll drop down to the bottom and they'll come back to us in 20 years from now and ask us if, uh, if uh, we've changed our minds. And so the Civic, which is already 100 years old, it's where my parents were born, it's where I and my siblings were born, it's long past its due date. Uh, and so replacing the entire hospital, um, as we are proposing to do with a $2.8 billion construction, uh, it's a, it's it's fairly unique in the in the province of Ontario. It's really quite a large facility for a, a, a hospital for for Ontario, and that's why the fundraising campaign, the local share is the largest, and the fundraising campaign is one of the largest in in the province. Okay, I, I see a lot of hands up from colleagues, so I'll, maybe I'll just wrap with a quick comment. Um, I do think it's uh, well. I don't think it's fair that the province puts so much uh, onus on local fundraising and local share to fund healthcare. I think this should be a provincial responsibility. That said, it is what we have in front of us. I think as a hospital, I would encourage you, I, I think your big challenge is really getting the message out as to the regional nature of this hospital. The perspective that several residents in Stittsville have shared with me is they would far more consider the, the Queensway Carleton or even the Carleton Place or Almont Hospitals as their local hospitals. I still, I still think there's perhaps a perception, rightly or wrongly, uh, that uh, the Civic is, is more of a, a downtown or a central type of hospital. And I think that's going to be a big challenge for, I guess, the future council in deciding how to proceed with the local share. It's to really get that communication and, and make sure there is support citywide for any kind of contribution. And then um, a comment, I guess, to, to Wendy and the team, encourage you to look for additional options, creative options. One resident suggested to me an optional uh, checkbox on a tax bill to, to make a contribution. And I think that recognizes as a large civic <clears throat> organization as the city, we are in a very ideal situation to help in the fundraising efforts. Uh, maybe if there's a voluntary way that people could make a $10 or $20 or voluntary contribution as part of their yearly tax filings, that could be another way that's uh, not putting a, a burden on, on all taxpayers and a creative solution as well. And I'm, I'm sure there's others that colleagues or residents might have and how the city could contribute. Thank you, Mayor. Great, thank you very much, Councillor Gower. Uh, Councillor Luloff, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and thanks so much uh, for, for coming to join us today, Cameron uh, and, uh, and Roger. Truly appreciate this. This is uh, going to be a world-class facility with an amazing story to tell. Um, uh, un unbelievable, uh, world-class uh, facility that uh, I'm very uh, excited to have uh, in our city. Uh, Wendy, um, you know, with the pending MPAC adjustment, uh, a levy of any amount uh, at this point in time would would certainly be unpalatable. I do really appreciate uh, that you know this request came in not long ago at all, and that your team has put together some very viable uh, ideas and options for us to consider in the next term of council. Uh, and I know that you have quite a bit of time uh, between now and when the when the final report comes for approval uh, to come up with other ideas. I I agree with Councillor Gower that. Uh, we should leave uh, no stone unturned here. I know that you have uh, proposed uh, several options. I just want to thank you and your team. Uh, I really don't know how you do it. Uh, you have uh, requests coming into you uh, every single day. Uh, and uh, to see that you were able to put together uh, a few palatable options in such a short period of time, I think uh, is going to make a massive difference with the end result. 
uh, we obviously want to be a good part, a community partner uh, to the to the Ottawa right. Hospital. I think that we are going to be able to find a way uh, to to make this contribution. Um, but uh, I certainly uh, want to make sure that uh, that it's clear that uh, I believe that my residents would find uh, any any amount of a levy at this time, especially with this MPAC adjustment. People have seen their their uh, their housing values uh, double uh, over the course uh, of the last uh, four years, five years. Um, and uh, so looking for those solutions is going to be uh, very important. So uh, thank you uh, for the presentation today. We truly appreciate it. Uh, Cameron and Roger. Roger, thank you very much for your personal contribution. I think that the, that's absolutely incredible and, and incredibly generous uh, and inspiring, uh, frankly. Uh, but, uh, you know, as mm -hmm. between now and when we meet again, uh, I wish you continued success with this project and uh, very much looking forward to seeing it come to fruition. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Ulof. Councillor El Shantiri, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, uh, Ms. Stephenson, this is not unique, this request. In the past, uh, maybe not with the, uh, since uh, the amalgamated city, but in the past, because I remember we dealt with something for uh, Bronson. Uh, I mean, they have a interest loan free from the city. And not too long ago, we, we had a new it. Uh, do you remember that uh, loan? Uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to the um, Dave Smith Youth Treatment Center. I know there was a, yes. a unique arrangement uh, that we did have with them. And um, I know they're just commencing uh, the build of a new facility. I want to say that announcement was made in the last couple of weeks. Um, yes. Our, As I had said, um, our research shows that in terms of an overall municipal contribution to a project this uh, sort of size, scale, and scope um, has not happened uh, since amalgamation. And you know, as as um, we said in the report, we're bringing this ask forward. Uh, we are required to do so uh, to let committee and council know that the ask has come and um, provided a framework in terms of how we could actually do that work and report back. And I understand that, but what I'm trying to to connect, so even we haven't done it under the new city, but in the past, and in the councillor who David Smith, uh, you know, treatment center been building, I, I recalled that, that loan. So it's not it's not unique for municipality to contribute or help uh, health care provider in the city, even if it didn't happen under the new city, but it happened before. Yeah, that's correct, councillor. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm glad we, you know, you're giving us option. And I have to tell you whether you are in Fitzroy uh, or you are in Far Cumberland or in the South, uh, Civic Hospital is still our hospital. Doesn't matter where we live. I think it, it served benefit to all of us. And I'm looking for some of the option you are bringing to us because quite honestly, uh, I live in Carp and my wife, she, she went to the Civic and other, I mean, I don't want to make it, this is a personal thing, but we all know the civic is not just to serve the downtown or the core or any of the hospital, as a matter of fact. So uh, I hope when you bring to us in the future, it'll be something clearly to uh, to, to make that the argument, the civic is not just for area specific. Is a, is a, is a citywide, is actually, we have folks flying from up north. I visit a few people, uh, law enforcement people who've been treated at the Civic from as far as Callaway come to the Civic. So I just wanna say, uh, I applaud you for taking on something like this and also providing us option. And to uh, to Mr. Love and Mr. Greenberg, well, thank you both for your leadership. Uh, Roger, again, your, you and your family showing some uh, leadership in the community and supporting a great cause to all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Elshantiri. Uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question is to um, our treasurer um, in regards to how much um, this hospital costs us because um, one of the uh, uh, the implications is traveling connections, uh, transit connections, which were only raised at the very last minute. Um, and uh, we're building a stage two LRT and um, we're gonna have to have some connectivity to this hospital to reach the goals that are 
outline that say that it's going to be um, climate change friendly. But um, I'm very concerned about the cost to our city um, taxpayers uh, on these um, on these uh, changes because uh, it means uh, changing a stop that was planned a long time ago, and um, and and cutting through a parking lot that is uh, being built first. So I just wanted to get an idea of, of the costs of, of those things. It's a great question, Councillor, and that's some of the work that we're going to need to take away in terms of those off-site um, capital improvements that need to be done with respect to the site plan. We don't have a full figure on um, what that's going to be. What I, I think, you know, if we look at sort of that LRT connectivity, and I'm going to say, um, you know, if I'm, I do a bit of a back of the napkin calculation, if we look at, you know, if there's some sort of connectivity, whether it's through a ped bridge or, you know, another means, um, that could be to the tune of $15 million. Um, don't know 100%, uh, but that's the work that we're going to do. And I'm just, I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, I know Mr. Willis um, is commencing an environmental assessment. That work is going to start in 2023 that will really inform uh, what the future is going to look like and sort of what that solution is going to look like as well. So I'm sure Mr. Willis uh, can provide more details on that. Sure. Thank you, uh, Wendy. Yes, as, as Wendy indicated, we are going to be commencing the process for an environmental assessment to link the transit station across Carling Avenue uh, to the hospital complex. Uh, it is a requirement under provincial legislation to do an EA, and the EA uh, looks at different options. So that will be either a bridge above or a below grade option. We'll look at them and cost them and have public consultation into that process and looking at, at how we can uh, get that connectivity that uh, both city and federal approvals contemplate. Thank you. And, and this is uh, outside of what is being asked because this is, this is all what uh, we, we have to um, do as a city to, to make um, this major piece of infrastructure connected to our system. Is that correct? Yes, I mean, certainly we, we've we identified it, both our approvals and the federal approvals, that this is a key piece for connectivity. Um, it's a huge opportunity to link uh, this, the hospital complex very properly into the uh, transit station with accessible access. So uh, we do need to get on with that, uh, uh, the, the approvals, the design and approvals process so that we know what that is. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, I'll uh, let others ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cavanaugh. Councillor Menard. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the report. Um, I wanted to start by just talking about um, the report itself and some of the recommendations in there um, and just get some clarification. And so, Wendy, we, we had met on this and I appreciate that uh, discussion. The, the potential for a local tax levy um, is, is likely not something that would proceed as I understand it, but I, I want to get clarity from you. Is, is there a potential that a local tax levy from residents across the city or, or in a residential area nearby that they could be paying something like that with this report in the future? Yeah, the, when you look at the guiding principles in the financial framework that we've included in the report, um, we're recommending uh, that one of those guiding principles be no to minimal impact on our taxpayers. And I had mentioned in my presentation that a tax levy is what I call a, a simple or an easy solution. Um, not suggesting that it's palatable or acceptable. Um, and we know we know that we can do that. So what we're asking for in this report is to use those guiding principles. So again, one of them being no to minimal tax impact on our taxpayers and go away and look at very unique solutions that are not a tax levy and bring those back uh, to committee and council for consideration. Um, so that's the work that we would like to do and report back on. Okay, I appreciate that this would go to the next council. I think any kind of multi hundred million dollar decision absolutely should be going to the next council uh, with proper consultation. Um, in, in terms of uh, the, the fundraising for this, <laughs> we're in a difficult spot in the core because the location is, is such a difficult one. Um, I think everyone will appreciate, um, you know, our, a lot of residents that uh, live in the area, this was treasured green space. Um, there's hundreds of trees that are being cut down here. 
um, as a result of the, the site plan and the site that was selected here. So it's difficult to ask them to then come back and, and fundraise for something or fund something that they uh, are very concerned about when it comes to the location uh, because of how poor a spot it is. Um, this is one area where we had a carbon sink here. Um, uh, hundreds of, uh, of, of visitors every day to the, the park areas and uh, a lot of trees that have already started coming down. So in terms of the environmental component of this, um, I'd, I'd uh, be very concerned if that was a, a way we we're using to, to fund this in that way. Um, I'll also just mention that I had raised this and it's a question, I guess, for Cameron Love, but I had raised this uh, during the deliberations on the site plan. And I asked specifically how much was Ottawa going to be asked for for a local share? And then there was no answer that came back at that time. I'm wondering why that is and why we're only being asked now after the site plan's been approved. So I can certainly start um, to answer that question, Councillor, and uh, very much remember the conversation that happened at committee. And uh, the answer that was provided um, in terms of the information that we had in front of us was we didn't know what the local share was going to be at that point in time. And we always committed to coming back um, to committee and council with respect to that ask. So now that the site plan has been approved and things are moving along, the request has been received. And so we're bringing that in front of you today. No, I appreciate that. Um, however, the question was asked then, and I'm sure there was knowledge of it then, and, and to have it come back now is, is, I feel, a bit disrespectful when we had the, the answer there um, in terms of how much the hospital would cost. On the costing, my understanding is we've been having overruns at hospitals in, in Ontario. I really think the province should be funding the entire thing. They shouldn't be asking for local shares. This is a provincial responsibility. We already get so much downloaded on us as a municipality. On the cost uh, of what the hospital's projected for right now, do we have confidence <clears throat> it's going to stay there? Do you want me to take that one, Wendy? That would be wonderful. Thank you, Cameron. So all good questions, Councilman Renard, and I'll try and uh, address them uh, in a slightly different order. So um, I, I think it's safe to say, and I think you would know this with what's happening within the industry and the supply chain market, there's not a construction project on the globe right now that's not impacted from a cost perspective. Um, and so I suspected with your own deliberations on various city projects, you've also got the same pressures, whether it's hospitals, whether it's community buildings, whether it's city buildings or housing development, the price of construction has risen. So the cabinet approval that we have uh, has a, a budget that's been approved with a confirmation of escalation that as we move, work through the last next year, we go out to RFP in, uh, in approximately July to select the consortia. We've got a year of working with the industry uh, and IO in terms of confirming the exact costs. There is no question escalation is a concern, but the government has outlined that for all approved projects, the cost of escalation will be part of the final sort of approvals as numbers confirm. But we're seeing numbers shift literally every quarter. Now, the big question is, and this is where it becomes a little challenging, is over the year, will it stabilize? Uh, but we've got full confirmation from government uh, that those costs will be covered from an escalation perspective. And our local share of 700 million to sort of add on to what Wendy said, when we brought this forward, we, we did not have final costs. The escalation piece was being confirmed. And Roger and his cabinet, through his leadership, have just confirmed the local share recently, which leaves a number of 150. Those pieces were, were all being worked through at that time. And that's why we didn't bring forward the specific ask. But the local share of 700 million is now confirmed. And as we go through the next year, that number stays the same. And we'll see what happens within the industry. And we'll work with the ministry on escalation costs. So that's question one. Um, the other question I think you raised, and I'm forgetting, actually, I'm sorry, Council, what was the second question you had in that? Well, we, we uh, were talking about the environmental impact here, and uh, that was an issue with the site itself. Um, yeah. I had ra raised that. So the in environmental stewardship, planetary health, and a direction to create a framework on trying to move towards a net zero platform in, in future years is absolutely a principle for this new site. And I, look, it's really unfortunate that we're having to take trees down. I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, while we're taking down about 590 trees over the course of the two phases, we're planting about 300, three, three, sorry, 3,000 new trees to try and restore all the canopy. Having said that, there is a much bigger picture here. When you look at healthcare hospitals and you look at what we 
um, the impact we have with the existing civic on things like utilities consumption, um, the, the inefficiency of this building, the impact on the environment, and particularly waste and waste management in terms of food, medical waste, hazardous waste, and those things. That is equally something that is just, you can't even compare the new to the old in terms of the impact it's going to have on the environment. So our entire plan with ministry of moving towards lead silver or above is focused around trying to create an entirely new platform that moves us to a, um, a carbon net zero platform over time. So it's not, look at the trees that are love. important, but that is, that is a, a key piece to this new puzzle. Dr. Love, I have uh, no issue with the new hospital. I want a new hospital in Ottawa. I think you know our, our issue has always been the way the site was selected, which was in an undemocratic fashion, and where it is now will drastically affect residents in that local area who use that green space, use those trees as a carbon sink. And so I think there was other locations this should have gone, um, but we, we had a very poor process federally, uh, provincially, and locally, and uh, we're ending up with a, a very poor site. I wish the best for the, hot, the new hospital, and we're doing our utmost to connect it uh, to make it better, connect with transit, uh, where we can with cycling lanes, the pedestrian walkthrough. Uh, our office has been very engaged on Preston and, and areas that uh, connect up with it from our ward, and we'll continue to do that and make the most of this. But I think, you know, there's a disappointment, and that's hard to fundraise when you've got a disappointment in, in that local area, given the, the drastic loss of green space in an area that already has such a small amount of green space. So I appreciate the answers, and I, I wish you the best. Um, I just want to be honest about uh, how residents are feeling so thank you okay uh we'll stick to the report where the site selection has been decided so let's stick to the report that's before us councillor brockington thank you mayor good morning to you um i do appreciate the report and the discussion today and my voting record and public comments on the hospital are very clear i too support uh this major project city building project um I'll start with questions to Ms. Stephenson. Um, there are a number of examples I can list where there are major projects or entities in the city that are struggling that could benefit from city contributions. And the arguments could be made about their economic contributors. There will be economic spinoffs in the city. There'll be tons of jobs. The airport's struggling, major economic contributor. We could contribute to this Queensway expansion. I'm not suggesting that's true, but you could make arguments. You could make arguments about how we should contribute to universities and colleges who need money. So Ms. Stephenson, what criteria did you use to assess this request and make a unilateral decision to bring this report to FEDCO? We did not give you that direction. We didn't give you that authority. So how did you make that decision? You're probably bombarded all the time for requests for money and support. Why this project and not other projects? Thanks very much, Councillor, for the question. Um, when staff received the request, we really took a step back and we looked at the best approach in terms of how do we inform members of council um, through whether it's a report, whether it's a motion, um, and quite frankly, do we inform uh, council with respect to this. Um, I can tell you in my tenure, this is the biggest, the largest, um, and quite frankly, the only request that I have received. Um, and what we did was we really took a step back. We did an environmental scan across Ontario. We wanted to see what did our municipal partners do in terms of this. I've talked a little bit about that this morning, um, about what the local share looks like in other municipalities across Ontario. Um, Mr. Love or Dr. Love has also spoken to what that looks like across uh, Ontario. And um, we know, uh, you know, small to medium municipalities choose to make a contribution and they do it in various different ways. Some of the larger municipalities, you look at Toronto as an example, chooses not to make a contribution. Um, this is probably uh, my first, it may not be the last, there could be other um, asks that come to us. Um, but based on that scan, we felt that it was important to bring a report forward um, and it was warranted really to allow for additional information and details to come to council members instead of just putting the ask in front of council. 
And the report really provides that context this morning around the request that came from um, the Ottawa Hospital uh, and the information from what other municipalities have done, as well as I'm going to say a little bit of thinking and knowing that we have a lot more thinking to do in terms of what some of those potential options might look like. And we've laid out a financial framework that will guide the work that we're going to do. Because without that, we really wouldn't have that guidance in terms of the work that's to be done and reported back on. Um, and that will give us the time to complete that review and bring it back to Council in, the, in early in the next term. So ultimately, this report provides the context that we feel is needed for members of Council to really make an informed decision today uh, around the recommendations that we've made. So just so I'm clear going forward about criteria that you use or triggers going forward, hypothetically speaking, if Algonquin College or Carleton University wants to go through a major expansion on their campuses, if the airport makes a strong economic case that they need funding from the city to help them, will you automatically bring a report to FEDCO? Councillor, I think it's very dependent in terms of what the funding mechanism is uh, for that particular entity, right? So um, in some instances, the province may be solely responsible for funding those projects. In other um, particular cases, it could be the federal government. So, you know, you're going to look at that and then you're going to bring a report or a request forward. In terms of this particular request, there is an expectation in terms of the project with respect to a local share. And that local share is made up of a number of buckets, right? So those buckets do include the municipality, the federal government, fundraising, et cetera. Sure. The local share in the presentation was broken down three ways. One is the um, I'll just call it the charitable campaign that Mr. Greenberg and his team are, are spear, spearheading. There's the municipal share, and then there's other revenues that uh, Mr. Love, although Dr. Love sounds good, that Mr. Love um, uh, talked about. So I want to get to the local share, the municipal share. There's capital dollars for a build, and then there's operating dollars that the hospital receives from non-City of Ottawa, or at least out-of-province residents. The Civic serves not just City of Ottawa residents, but residents of Eastern Ontario. It serves residents of Western Quebec, and they serve residents of Nunavut and probably other locations. So if we're talking about benefiting from a world-class center, it's not exclusive to City of Ottawa residents or City of Ottawa taxpayers. So just talking about the capital side, not the operating side when people receive service from out of Ontario and there's that, the exchange happens for that service. But how much are they contributing? Are we asking recipients from other jurisdictions to contribute because this is their trauma center, this is their main center that they come to regionally. Why is it all on the city of Ottawa taxpayer shoulders for this municipal share? And are they gonna be expected to contribute to capital costs as well? I'm gonna ask uh, Cameron to answer that question. I think he can do it much more eloquently than I can and more informing. <laughs> I'll give it my best, Wendy. So, uh, Councillor Brockington, thanks for the question, and it's a good one. So, um, maybe I can just talk about the way um, capital shares have worked and why municipal, municipalities contribute, and then answer your question in the mix of that. So, there is a long history, going at least 30 years, and Roger referenced 15 is probably right, where you know, we can debate whether the province funds 10% more and makes it 100 versus 90. But I think to Roger's point, every other municipality has done this and they've moved all their projects through. So it's not really something that I, I would expect ever the governments to change because all municipalities are doing it. When you take places like Kempville, Hawkesbury, Cornwall, Pembroke, uh, Eastern and Western Quebec, they all have hospitals. Their municipalities all fund various portions, whether it's equipment, all these small hospitals have had uh, expansions or development. And when you take a look at those small communities, if a community that's got 15,000 people puts an MRI, MRI and it's 5 million bucks, typically the municipalities are making a contribution to that. So $5 million for a community of 15,000 people is, it seems like a small amount of money, but it's a significant portion of what that municipality does. 
And so there has always been a foundation where municipalities either support through land or money or acquisitions or building developments. And that's a long history in Champlain and all across Ontario. Here's the piece that is the flip side that doesn't occur. Is so when we, um, when we build this trauma center, we take trauma from everywhere. And if you have to the common, I can't remember who said it, of patients in Stittsville, even though a patient may go to Queensway, we get dozens of transfers coming from Queensway to TOH because of the complexity of care that's required. If you have trauma, vascular disease, you have a stroke, you have a heart attack, whichever it is, they're all coming to the trauma center. Same thing with Western Quebec. So they'll deal with a lot of the population, but if you have a real complex disease, it comes here. We get funded for that and all the economic benefit of the growth associated with that, we don't send the revenue back to those communities. Everything on the economic report that allows the capacity to be built in the center of Ottawa associated with building and being a regional trauma center, yes, we may have to fund the capital, but all the operating, all the economic benefit, all the hiring of staff that live in these areas to support those regions, we don't send the revenue back to them. So it's always been structured that way. And it's a fair, it's a fair question, Riley, but I, I do think the way it's structured is, is, you know, it's what we have to work with. And there is a significant benefit to having a regional center both for the local constituents of Ottawa and being able to support these reasons, both from, a, from an operating and what we get funded and how we deal with economic growth. Uh, and then the only other comment that I, I did wanna, um, uh, actually, maybe I'll stop there. I think I, did I answer all your questions, Councillor? Yeah, I think um, looking ahead at how this is communicated with the general public once, uh, if this passes and the yeah. Stephenson report comes out that talks about options next year, um, there has to be a, a careful explanation to the public who are worried about free transit and, uh, you know, rising property tax bills with inflation and there was the impact reference. This just piles onto it, regardless of how um, important this project is to the area and the city, uh, there's a limit that taxpayers can afford. And so I think the communication has to be very clear uh, and to the point on this matter. Yeah. Councillor, if I can uh, pipe in just for a sec, I can assure you that I have met with contributors who are outside the city of Ottawa. I've Carlton Place, Montreal, Toronto, Kingston, East End of Ottawa, the Quebec side. We've received outstanding gifts from, from many, many families that live outside of Ottawa. In many cases, some of them who will not be using uh, the, the, the facilities of, 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 this new, uh, of this new hospital. They, ha they have business interests in the city and they understand that as part of their, um, I guess like my family, they're, 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 my family, five of my seven shareholders don't live in Ottawa. The gift came from all of us. We were born in Ottawa, but they all live elsewhere. So I can assure you that from the fundraising side of the $500 million, a significant component of that will come from families who will never step foot, not because they don't want to, but they live in their own jurisdictions, they will, they will go into their own hospitals. So I think it's fair to say that the, the lion's share of the fundraising campaign will come from a much larger group than just residents of the city of Ottawa who are going to be using it. And we're benefiting from their, from their contributions. Mr. Mayor, may I add one other comment? Yep, go ahead. Okay, um, just to, to add to that, Councillor, I, I think there's another piece that, and I, I appreciate the advice around communication, I couldn't agree more. I mean, communication as we roll this out has been key the whole way along and it's even growing now in terms of the, the importance of this, particularly as we're starting into implementation. But I, I would suggest there's another perspective to this that we hear from the community. And I, you may not hear this, but as a hospital that provides this regional service, we hear it in spades, is we need to increase access for this community. Uh, whether you're waiting for surgery, whether you have long wait times in the emergency department, whether you can't get a type of procedure because we don't have the physical capacity or the right advanced technology, we get a lot of that in it. And so there's been a, a tremendous turn of support I find from not only building a new hospital, but what are the technologies? How's it gonna improve access to care? And we get that through all your wards. Um, and so I know Roger sees it through the campaign um, with contributions. We see it from the perspective of we need this new hospital to really build a stronger healthcare system. And I think it has been hit very hard through this pandemic. And this gives a little bit of hope to people on building something that is really gonna make a difference from the outcome of health. It doesn't matter whether you live in Pembroke, Carp, you know, right in Dow's Lake uh, to where Councilor Menard's comments were or wherever, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece we need to build for this community. Thank you for your presentation today, thank you. 
Thanks, Councillor Brogdon. Councillor Deans, please. <clears throat> Um, thank you. I'm just, uh, I, I want to start by asking uh, how we arrived at the $150 million ask. Is that some sort of standard formula? Is it a percentage? Or is it being, um, can, can it be directed or is it be intended to be directed to something that could be quantified as a particular City of Ottawa benefit on this project? I'm going to ask um, Cameron to answer the question around how they arrived at the 150 councillor. I think uh, that's important context for this morning. Yeah, great, great count, um, question, Councillor Dean. So two parts to that. Uh, some of it is just uh, quite honestly straight math where uh, once we had confirmation of the campaign target of 500 million, uh, knowing what we have now confirmed out of government and approved through cabinet and what we can calculate with our own business plan uh, from a retail perspective and some of that required time because it you know depending on what's approved by government and what we can put in for retail etc that 50 million dollar number they've all sort of come to fruition over the course of the last you know month uh, and so with all of that uh, what it lands on is is a pretty simple equation around 500 from the work that Roger's leading, 50 confirmed now what we can actually create from a business plan, and the remaining 150 is yes. So that was part one. The other part is uh, referencing what Wendy had spoke about before, is really doing a bit of a, uh, an assessment across uh, the province on what others had done and what seemed reasonable. And there is, there is more art than science, to be quite honest, honest counselor on that. Every, every area, there is no sort of standard that gets applied across the board where it's X percent for this or X percent for that. It, but it, in terms of looking at what new hospitals have been built in Ontario over the last course of the last decade, what other municipalities contributed, and plus our own situation, those are the two factors that landed on the 150. And, and just the, the last question that I had asked there about the community benefit, could this $150 million be directed to something we could point at, um, specifically adding benefit to the city? Cameron, um, can you speak to the, the yeah. local share? Yeah, so um, I hadn't thought about it that way, Councillor, but it's a fair comment. I mean, if there was something in our overall plan of what we're building where the city said we're contributing to X, Y, and Z to build, and it still allows that 150 bill to contribute, but the city to be recognized for that piece as part of the development, uh, I don't, I don't, I, I, I have no concern. I don't see any issue with that. I think as part of Wendy's work going forward, we, we could look at doing that. And there's, there are so many things that are being built within this, uh, ranging from infrastructure to ORs to everything else. If there's things that council would like to have a better understanding on, we can definitely do that work if it helps to sort of solidify a, a direction that uh, seems more appropriate. Cameron, let me, let me jump in as well to uh, Councillor Deans. This is a, what we call a recognition campaign. And this is something that we, we, we advise all donors, those who are interested. We do have some donors who wish to remain anonymous, but, but there are a lot of donors uh, who have indicated that yes, they're very proud of their contribution and they, they understand that this is uh, by a recognition campaign is how you can uh, serve as a, as, a, as, a, as a guiding post to them. So we don't have the ability to specifically provide the recognition details today because the final plans haven't been done, but we're keeping track of every donation that our, that our contributors give and we will go back to them and based upon uh, a gradation scale, a pyramid, so to speak, of, of recognition opportunities, based upon the amount that the that the um, that the uh, that the donor has provided, will provide a, an adequate and appropriate level of recognition. So certainly, the city of Ottawa is interested in doing something like that. When the plans get to be a little bit further along the line, my guess would be sort of a year to eighteen months out. You know, happy to sit down with the city and in the context of what its contribution is and to make sure that the residents of Ottawa recognize that that's the way that this hospital was built. It, 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 it's, it's, um, we can talk about you know, how unfair it is and that the province should pick up 100% of it. Uh, I would give the same argument, but at the end of the day, all that's going to mean is that we're not going to get the new hospital built. And you've taught, you heard about how, how, how decrepit the current facility is, how, how environmentally unfriendly it is, and the, the benefits that will come from the health care. And you know, what we're asking is that the city of Ottawa participate with my efforts and the efforts of the team that I have assembled and working with the foundation at the hospital and the business plan at the hospital. And we all chip in together to, to build a facility that we will be incredibly proud of, but more to the point, we'll move healthcare in our region decades ahead of where it is today. 
I just want to follow up on, I've heard it twice this morning now, that if the $700 million local contribution isn't made, that we'll drop to the bottom of the heap and we won't get the hospital. Um, but I also heard Ms. Stephenson say this morning that the City of Toronto does not contribute to hospital bills in the City of Toronto. So I'm just wondering, on what basis are you contending that we would not get a much needed hospital in this city without a local contribution. Cameron, can you take that question? Yeah, for sure, Wendy. Uh, another great question, Councillor Deans. So um, it, it really becomes, it, it, it doesn't jeopardize that we will get this approved. What it jeopardizes is the timing uh, to Roger's point. So one of the big elements to any capital development project, whether it's you know $100,000 or whether it's $4 billion is, how do you pay for it? And so part of our final phase over this last year, um, uh, as we're scheduled to go to construction early in 24, all of 23 is working through the RFP process, working through the tendering process, completing all those things and finalizing exact costs and how the hospital pays for their share. Uh, and so at the end of the day, if we can't pay for our share, um, then what it is, is typically what will happen is go back to the drawing board and take some more time to find the share. The challenge with it is, is that just means others that have their share, like Windsor, like Trillium, like Sick Kids, they will bump to the top of the list and they'll push those projects out earlier. And so there's always the risk that if government in a term has approved X amount of capital and you push that, push that bar out further, then they just push it to the next term because they've got so much pent up demand. Uh, and so that, that is where the real risk is. It's not that it will not, not be approved. It's already approved. It, now we're into the timing of implementation. Um. You mentioned the federal contribution was the contribution of land. Is that their sole contribution? Yeah, and have you quantified the value of that contribution? When we did this initially back uh, a number of years when the land was transferred, uh, while it wasn't a comprehensive review, we did have a land appraisal, which was about two to two and a half million an acre. So about a hundred million dollar contribution. If you actually predict, you know, from a land appraisal perspective. So really the city of Ottawa is being asked to contribute more than the federal government. Uh, true, but I, the only comment I'd made on that, Councillor Deans, and it's, I think it's, I think if I understand where you're going, no other province in this, no other area in this province has a federal contribution. So we're very fortunate in Ottawa to have that uh, component that's been added. Okay, um, I think, this question, if the city manager is on, might be for him or Ms. Stephenson, but it seems to me that uh, we had a, a number of hospital requests for funding shortly after amalgamation. I wondered if you could remind us what council decided, because it seems to me, if memory serves, um, that originally there was some contribution of development charge revenue, and then after that, council decided that we would not make contributions. So can you just remind me of uh, who made the ask and what the ultimate council decision was? I, oh, sorry. Steve, would you like to go ahead or I'd be happy to take the question? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor, I'll be able to provide uh, a partial answer in terms of what the decision was. I'm happy to do that. Um, and I can go back and get um, the actual ask uh, for your reference. I'm happy to do that as well. And I may lean on my colleague, um, Searle, who's also uh, on the meeting this morning to provide some more details here. Um, but what was happening was um, hospitals were required to pay DCs in the past. A decision was made at a point in time to exempt the hospitals from DCs, but we were having to make that contribution ourselves to make up the shortfall of those DCs. And so that was, I'm going to say, putting a bit of a pressure in terms of that exemption um, that was happening. So ultimately, today, in terms of development charges, um, what happens is the hospital is not required to pay the full DCs, but they do pay the transit DCs. The issue with that is that there is no recognition in terms of a local share contribution with respect to that arrangement. So as much as um, that benefit is given, we cannot claim that as part of our local share uh, contribution. Is Mr. Kanalakis going to follow up and remind me what um, council decided about contributions? I see Searle's on the line, and I think he has some information as well. 
Yeah, go ahead, Cyril, then I can jump in if you don't finish. Uh, thank you, Wendy, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so Councillor, some additional information that uh, I reviewed as we were kind of doing this little bit of analysis was up to February of 2009, the city had exempted, waived, waived or reimbursed approximately $17 million in terms of fees or charges uh, and $7 million in land transfers and capital grants. Uh, subsequently in 2009, council at the time approved this be this policy, policy be revised and it was a sunset clause implemented. So that's the details that we were able to find in the, in the past practice. What was the revision of the policy? Like what did council decide? So it was basically starting subsequent to 2009, uh, the sunset clause of reimbursing building permits and planning applications. Uh, that was basically sunset clause where it was used in the past practice. Okay, so we wouldn't do that anymore is what we said. Okay. That's correct, that's correct. And Mr. Kanellakis? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't have anything else to add. That was my recollection um, um, of what was occurring at the time. I wasn't involved in that side of the, uh, of the business at the time. I was uh, in operations, but um, that's my understanding what happened um, at that time. Council made a definitive decision in 2009. Thank you, those are all my questions. Councillor Fleury. Yes, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Roger and, and Cameron. Um, I, I will echo a number of, of colleagues, I guess, oh, we're now much more awake of some of the shortfalls in, in health funding and um, the impacts that will have on, on local taxpayers uh, at different levels. So, so thank you. Um, thank you for that. And, and thank you for steering the ship towards a a new world-class hospital, which is much needed, as as you've uh, rightly described, and and are, are striving for. And and Roger, personally, uh, thank you for leading the fundraising campaign and, and for uh, for uh, your personal con contribution. It's uh, it's it's very important. So so um, I guess I'll, uh, my questions are really to staff. So I just wanted to uh, to maybe uh, begin by by that. Um, Wendy, on on the framework that we're proposing. Are there any directions that would be helpful? I, I, I'm hearing a number of elements raised by uh, committee and council members this morning um, relating to, I guess it comes down to elements that are needing funding for, but, and how those would be funded and sources. Uh, uh, sources. Um, specifically for us, like if we accounted for at this point, city infrastructure upgrades that will be needed uh, for uh, the site, including roadway, transit. I'll go even as far as, as hydro, which as we know is an external partner, but certainly uh, 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 do, we, uh, do we have an account of all of those figures so far and, and how would that play into our municipal contribution? And is the, the hospital in line that that would apply to the 150 million? So uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to walk you through this and clarify some of this. Um, that is uh, part of the important work that we need to take away and do. Um, when the site plan came, uh, there's definitely some um, off-site capital works that are identified as a result of that. We need to take all of that away. We need to put values to those things um, to determine what does this look like? What is the dollar value associated with this? And then that would form part and parcel in terms of what we bring back to you as to um, could this be the local part of the local share. So that's part of the work that we need to do. We have crafted um, the uh, the guiding principles such that it gives us the guidance to be able to do this work. So when you talk about, you know, necessary or other directions, um, we feel that with the framework that you have in front of us or in front of you today, that we can go away and do this work. We don't need additional directions to be able to do that. I've heard a number of um, great suggestions and ideas this morning that we will take away with respect to this and apply those lenses and, and certainly say, um, you know, if anybody has any ideas, we're always welcome to hearing um, please do share them and we will take them away and we will look at those okay okay so and and have, have we put some context or framework to elements that are untouchable for us for example no new debt issuance or something of sort like is that helpful at this point or is are you, as part of your framework you will do the, the proper analysis to come back and and 
the next council will have the full consideration of, of the landscape that's presented? That's correct. So the, the latter comment is correct. This will give us the framework to be able to do that work and bring it back. Um, so no direction with respect to that. Okay. Okay. Just final comments. And thank you, Wendy. Um, we, we have to realize not only the importance of care through the Ottawa hospital, but also the importance to our local economy. Uh, Cameron was speaking earlier about the economic impact of the workforce that is directly hired by the hospital or, or indirectly and in offering a number of services. Um, I know counselors were very territorial, but I think in this case, we have to be extremely careful on how we position that. Uh, if, if someone shows up with a heart attack at Montfort and is sent to Civic Heart Institute, it doesn't matter that they live in the east part of town. If someone gives birth at Queens or Carlton and then they're, they're, there's a future connection to CHEO, the, this is integrated healthcare, and that's what we want. We don't want to be territorial healthcare. I, I've had personal um, findings of that um, uh, with family members that have had to go to, to St. Justin, for example, for treatment for, for cancer treatment or, um, or epilepsy uh, research that, out of Montreal years ago. Uh, so the integrated network of free healthcare in Canada requires us to be a much more open minded. Professionals and world class healthcare is what matters. And then after that, the patient that needs it, no matter where they live, will be connected. And I think we need to be open-minded to that spirit that Cameron, his team, and, and the health professionals, if there is something that is available for a local resident to get treatment that's not available in Ottawa, they connect us across the country. And I think we, we need to be open-minded to doing the same thing. So just putting a bit of a cold shower on some of those comments relating to territory, I, I think it's a bit broader um, and, and I, I applaud the patience and the work that, that led to, uh, to the development of this plan. And, and yeah, future councils will have uh, to be open, open to, to the impacts and, and be part of the solution along the way. And, and I will put my caveat that transit needs to be central to that, to that effort again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Harder and just, um, uh, for the benefit of members of committee, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor DeRuz will take over in a few moments. I have to do a, a quick uh, interview and uh, we'll be back. But we have Councillor Har Harder and then uh, we vote on this report and then we go to Community Partners Insurance Program. So just to give a heads up to Councillor DeRuz, that'll be the next item where Mr. White will give a, a brief presentation and then there's one public delegation, uh, Mr. Cullen. So Councillor Harder. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Like usual, I was not planning on speaking because I thought that this opportunity that Miss um, um, Stephenson has uh, presented to us uh, through the ask of uh, the Ottawa Hospital um, was um, quite benign in the fact that she's asking for time to kick the tires on opportunity. But what I've heard today is still some of the same old stories about whose responsibility, um, who's asking, who's giving what, whatever, whatever. And, and fortunately, the people that are going to vote on this request today seem to be in sync uh, with supporting the opportunity as laid out by Ms. Stephenson. I thank uh, Roger Greenberg developer that you are, Mr. Greenberg. I thank you. Because in this city, it's not like Toronto where they have um, a plethora of, uh, of industry that step up to the plate. We, that's it, that is not who we are. I would say that in this city, the people that contribute the most, whether it's to the Heart Institute, whether it's to the Arts Court, whether it is to universities and hospitals, the Minto Rec, the Richcraft Center, the Richcraft, Senseplex, et cetera, et cetera, are the very people that are often um, accused of some kind of atrocities in this city by very people that are on this screen right now. And I was not surprised to see the um, contribution uh, that you led uh, from um, uh, Minto, uh, your family company of $25 million for this most important project that we have had. Um, we are fortunate to be given 
the opportunity by the province to have this state of the art facility. You know what? I, I heard Roger saying that uh, he was uh, born at the hospital. His parents were born in the hospital. Sean Menard has said, I think he said your mom was born at the hospital. Um, certainly I was born at the hospital. We can all have our stories of parts of the Ottawa hospital, but we can't, what we can't do is do without it. And what we can't do is deny that we must move forward with the opportunity and not hesitate. When I get emails from people still talking about don't pick the land site and all this kind of nonsense, move on. We have moved on. When I was first elected back in 1997, I think it was in 1998, I, uh, the Queensway Carlton Hospital asked us to contribute a um, million dollars to a campaign they were, they were running. So asked the PN Council. And I was the swing vote. And I remember calling Ben Franklin that afternoon and saying, you know what, Ben, like I, I'm always trying to be fiscally responsible. I'm always trying to follow like whose responsibility it is. I just don't know what to do. And he said to me, Jan, you can never go wrong with supporting our Queensway Carlton Hospital. And to that end, I did. And I was the swing vote. And I can say that people in the councillors that have been elected in the West End of Ottawa understand that in spades. And we have become ace ambassadors. We have become ambassadors for our local hospital. This hospital is about so much more than just Ottawa. It is about such a greater area. It brings so much opportunity. Somebody was talking about the number of jobs. I look at the, at the uh, research dollars that it brings into our universities to upgrade them to such a superior level about the industries that will come to follow it because they wanna be here. You know, when I was working on precision agriculture uh, a few years back, a very large uh, international company came and met with Jack Kitts at the time. I think Cameron, you were probably on that call, wanting to be in a place that understood what an investment in healthcare meant, wanting to bring their head offices to a place that was going to be um, uh, enriching uh, the health experience for families and for employees. You know, through um, a little a little golf tournament that I had for many years. Um, we raised almost a million dollars for the Queensway Carlton Hospital. And I will never, ever be sorry for that. And I certainly at council will be supporting this opportunity that Ms. Stevenson has asked us to give her the time to see what we can do to step up to the plate to make sure that that first hospital that gets the money is the Ottawa Hospital. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Harder. Uh, I see uh, anyone on the committee like to comment before we move to the vote. I don't see any hands up. I, I personally want to thank uh, Wendy and her team for the great presentation. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Cameron Love for being here this morning. And of course, Mr. Greenberg and your family has been always part of uh, building the city. It's not the first time that you be part of any uh, community building uh, project in our city. So from that, we're all thankful from the city of Ottawa. We appreciate uh, the generosity of your family. Uh, we move uh, to our, we have a recommendation that the Finance and Economy Development Committee recommended council one, receive the information on the local chair, including the request municipal portion as outlined in this report to approve the financial framework and guiding principle for developing a response to the Ottawa Hospital's request as outlined in this report. And three, direct staff to review and report back in the next term of council with options for municipal portion of local share contribution and for direct staff to bring forward a background study and amending bylaw to impose special area development charges to fund the future increase in, in, in need for service required for the new Ottawa Hospital Civic Campus and to repeal the current discretionary exemption listed in Clause 7 for existing 
and the existing development charges by law 2019 156. Uh, all in favor? Carried. 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 Okay. Thank you, Carried. and I appreciate uh, the delegation, and thank you, uh, staff, for a great presentation. Uh, we move to item number five on the agenda, and uh, we have a presentation. Uh, we do have presentation uh, uh, from Dave White, and it is Community Partner Insurance Program. Thank you, Chair. Just, oh. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Thank you. Oh, my apologies. Um, just by way of background, and just to, to, to kind of set up the, the, the basis on why, why staff are here and why staff are recommending what they are, um, just so uh, members are aware, the Community Partners Insurance Program is, has existed prior to amalgamation. Um, and that's because you, you know, the former municipalities um, saw value in providing access to group insurance for those um, community groups, community partners um, that were providing kind of community programming uh, in partnership with the former municipalities. And so at Amalgamation, that kind of program was continued. Um, and again, recognizing that those community groups operate essentially as an extension of the city in providing that kind of programming that they're and um, providing access to that coverage, provided protection for the association as well as for the city. At the time, um, and this is going back to 2001, staff had recommended that the city look to recover the cost of premiums from all of those community associations. Um, and that would have been started in 2003. Council of the day determined that for those community associations that were already receiving their, their insurance premiums from the municipality, um, essentially their insurance premiums were paid, that that should be continued. And so what we have had since 2001 is, has really been two groups in the Community Partners Insurance Program, um, those whose insurance was funded by the municipality and those that had to provide uh, their own premiums. And that was irrespective of the fact that they may well have been providing the same types of community programming, um, all again in partnership with the city. And so during the, um, the consideration of the budget last year, members may recall um, some members of council, some of the community associations had raised concerns about the apparent inequity um, that was caused in that, uh, particularly in, in, a, in a, a toughening insurance market, with rising premiums that there were groups essentially providing the same levels of service and the same types of programming that um, were not receiving um, community or uh, sorry, municipality funded premiums. And so staff undertook to go away and to see how that might be resolved. And so what staff are recommending, and that's what you have before you today is essentially to provide, to put all of those, those community groups on an even footing. Um, and to, to provide insurance, um, whether they were part of the original 2001 group or not, and to extend that coverage in that way. The other concern that, that staff had heard at the time, of course, was with respect to the, the growth in the, the amount of the deductible. And that had been, and that varies depending on, on the period. It had been $2,500, and that's the amount that any association is required to pay in the event that there is a claim. Uh, so that had gone from 2,500, it had dropped to 500, um, but it had risen again more recently to 2,500. Staff have addressed that through having secured more favorable terms in the latest renewal for the community partners program. And so there is now no deductible um, for any of those community associations. So that is in essence, what staff are proposing is in essence to put all of the, the community groups on an equal footing. Staff are not proposing to essentially to do away with the parameters, well, what they call the parameters for acceptance. And that's why there still should be some shared interest, a common interest between the municipality and the, the community group in terms of the delivery of programming. And that's seen in an agreement between the city and that community group for the, the provision of that programming. And that's simply out of a recognition that there may be hundreds or probably thousands of community groups that may well be um, holding events, doing community activities 
but they're not doing it in partnership with the city. And to extend city funded premiums to all of those groups without any, without any kind of evidence of a relationship with the city, without them being an extension of the city, it, one exposes the, the group as a whole to significant risk in terms of potential premiums, um, but it's also just not good risk management practice. And so that's what staff were proposing. Um, and we staff, certainly staff believe that we have addressed the concerns about the, the, the kind of two tiered um, approach that had existed previously, as well as the concerns regarding the, the amount of the deductible. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. White, for uh, the context and for the presenta uh, verbal presentation. We do have uh, one delegation. It's Mr. Alex Collin, and he's not strange to our uh, council. And uh, Mr. Collin, are you there? Yes, thank you, Mr. I Chairman. See, I see you, and you have five minutes. Thank you very much for coming, and you go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Alex Cullen. I'm the president of the Federation of Citizens Associations. I'd like to thank Mr. White uh, for his presentation. Uh, uh, some members of this committee will remember that uh, the FCA showed up at the budget meeting of Community and Protective Services Committee and the uh, to raise the issue about uh, the uh, community uh, partnership insurance program, the fact that it was capped, the fact there was about 30 odd uh, community associations, particularly in the growth areas that were outside of the program having to pay full freight for their insurance. And I would like to thank Councillor uh, Luloff for his leadership in uh, recommending that staff conduct this review. This review came about because we showed up, the community association were contacting their counselors, and the committee was very, uh, had heard the message and staff agreed to conduct that review. Uh, the assumption was that we would be consulted in that review and that review would be completed by June. Unfortunately, just uh, uh, less than a little more than 10 days ago, we became aware of the report. Uh, and what we're here today is simply to ask for time to digest the report, uh, talk to staff about the unresolved issues. Uh, Mr. White has laid out um, how the uh, uh, groups that do have a contractual relationship come into the system, that's fine. Uh, what's happening to deductible, that's fine, but that's not the whole story. As you know, many community groups use city facilities for other events, uh, and we would want to talk to staff about, okay, what can be done to enable these community groups to continue to do those things? So all we're asking for is time, time for us to consult. Our community associations meet monthly, getting the report just a matter of uh, less than two weeks ago, um, doesn't cut it, and we're just asking for a one month uh, deferral to your next to your June meeting so that we can talk with our members, talk with staff, and come back with an informed response to what staff are proposing. I think we're on the right road, but we do believe that public consultation in this matter uh, is important, and our community groups are asking us uh, for that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Collin. And I have a question for Mr. Collin. I, Mr. Uh, Councilor Lieber. Oh, sorry. sorry, it was a question for staff. Thank okay, you. Okay. We'll move to staff right after the delegation. Any question to the delegation? Uh, thank you, Mr. Collin, and we appreciate your uh, delegation this morning. And we'll move uh, for question to staff from Councilor. Uh, I have Sh Councilor Shantiri and Councilor Lieber. So, Councilor Shantiri, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> My question to Mr. White, if, uh, if I understand correctly, so we, some of the community, so, and I'm, I'm speaking for the rural area, obviously, because uh, it, uh, those community associations, they're not staffed by uh, city staff. They are uh, obviously, uh, the city support them and, 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 and help them, but, and uh, so, What's going to change for them today? So they still cover uh, the, the member on the board or the director on the board and the activities, but what's the changes, if I understand it correctly from the report, is going to be for a new user. So if, uh, if uh, someone wants to use the hall for, a, for an event, uh, they have to have extra insurance. Is that what's going to change on us? Mr. Chair, staff are, aren't proposing changes with respect to 
insurance for what we would call like a one-off event. And so essentially a rental agreement. Um, there is insurance available through the city. Um, depending on the nature of the event, that will, will determine the cost. It is normally of a nominal, of a nominal cost with respect to a, a rental of a city facility to a, a community group or whoever it might be um, to rent that. So staff aren't proposing any change in that. Um, that would remain, and again, that's that's available um, at a at a very nominal cost. What you'll what you'll see is if there were groups that were providing um, community programming. So you know there are there are any number of groups that do so. If they were if they were required to fund their own premiums as a result of that that twenty year old decision. Um, if, if they are providing that same kind of programming as others who are having their insurance premiums funded, then they will be eligible to have those premiums paid by the city going forward. Staff are, are proposing essentially a transition year um, for the next period, appreciating that there may take some time to ensure that uh, you know, the agreements that, that those groups have are, are in place and that they're updated as necessary. So is it fair to say when, when we talk about the insurance is going to be uh, on, on, a, on a rental, like it's, it's not going to be a standard Red right Cross. It's, it's going to be depend uh, on the group and the user. The reason I'm asking you this, because been asked from uh, our community, every time they want to rent the hall, they have to reach someone in the city. And it's not always someone dedicated to the rural community association because rural community association is different than other community run by the city. Those are run by volunteers. So I don't wanna create additional burden on a volunteer who run our community programs. Uh, you know, is, is it gonna be a, a standard? This is what you need, you, you both like as a, as a director or, or as a, uh, member of the association, you're covered. But if, if you have this group doing programming, they have to talk to us in the city, whether legal or uh, recreation staff, I'm not sure. But we need a point of contact. That's what what's missing sometimes. Yeah, I think there are, there are kind of a few questions in that. I, I should be clear, the Community Partners Insurance Program provides only what we call CGL, so commercial general liability. It does not provide um, it's additional insurance. So some associations may wish to, to secure directors and officers liability, or if they, they actually have their own property, they may secure property. Um, and while we provide um, kind of an avenue to, to secure that, um, that's never been part of, of the Community Partners Insurance Program. In terms of, of facility rentals, again, you know, that would normally be handled at the time of that rental. Um, and so it wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily have uh, a, an annual premium that would cover all of the, all of the rentals of that facility, uh, but that would be dealt with in, in concert between um, presumably the, the, the you know, facility group and uh, legal services if need be. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think Mr. Uh, Mayor Watson is back. If not, uh, next speaker is Councillor Gower. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Mr. White, um, can you define a little bit more this formal written service agreement associated with the associated with the delivery of recreational, cultural, or community services? Community associations provide a wide, wide range of activities through partnerships with the city. There's some like Dover Court that have quite a integrated and advanced um, operation. There's others that might have some very small programs that don't even run year round. So can you give a little more context as to what would or would not qualify? Um, Chair, the, the principle behind the, the CPIP, and this goes back to when it was established 20 some odd years ago, um, is that it, it's, it's, it's not intended for one-off events, but it is meant for ongoing programming. So it doesn't need to be year-round programming. A number of associations wouldn't necessarily be providing um, year-round programs simply because it's, it may well be seasonal or something like that. So those kinds of things um, are covered. 
generally speaking, again, there may be activities that some groups take on that, uh, depending on, for example, the risk profile, that it may be that an insurer isn't prepared to insure those. Um, none come immediately to mind, but um, it's always possible. Um, so the, the, the range of, of kind of cultural and recreational program, as you say, is quite broad. Um, and that's, again, that's why staff are proposing this, this period to ensure that those, uh, the agreements that we have, that the city um, in kind of engages those community groups as an extension of city programming, that those are in place, that they're up to date, and that, um, you know, we have some ability, in essence, to, to ensure that they're following, for example, good risk management practices. Okay, I, I have, well... The Stittsville Village Association has raised some concerns that you're aware of, and I, I want to follow up with some spe on some specific ones offline and not take the committee's time. But they had a couple of specific issues that I wanted to raise because I'm pretty sure they would apply to other grandfathered community associations who have been relying on the insurance available from the uh, from the community partner program. Um, they gave two examples. One is their Canada Day fireworks that previously their insurance was covered through this program, and they're very concerned about um, about not being able or not being able to afford insurance without the partnership program through the city. And the other is around the annual parade, an important civic event. It's not officially a civic a city program, but uh, they're concerned that that would no longer be insurable because of the uh, high cost of their organization. Are there any alternate city programs available or that could be explored that would help provide organizations that do put on civic events, but that wouldn't qualify through these current recommendations uh, to provide an alternative to them? Chair, those are certainly um, things that, that staff, we, we look at all the time and we, we would do that in, in concert with the, our, our, our colleagues in the various uh, operating departments. But certainly the, the city has access through its broker to insurance for those types of events that it can, it, it can provide either access to or depending on the nature of the funding model, um, it may be able to fund those. But generally speaking, the, again, the individual one-off events are, would, or wouldn't be something that would be covered by the community partners insurance program, but it might still be um, available under the, the, the kind of the package of the city's overall integrated program, or at least access to it. Okay, uh, thank you. And, and uh, last question is around uh, what kind of benchmarking or comparisons have you done with other Ontario municipalities? And is this in line with what, uh, what we would see in other cities? Um, Mayor, staff are actually aren't aware of any municipality that provides funding for the premiums. Um, I, if I go back, if I, I actually go back to 2001, the recommendation was that the municipality recover those premiums from um, the community associations. And so we were in a bit of a, uh, I don't know if we're, we're unique in that regard, but ordinarily, while these kinds of group policies are made available, um, through the municipality, simply because they're they're able to secure more favorable rates, the the idea of the municipality providing the the funding for the premiums would it, it may be they may do it on a on a one off through um, community funding grants or something like that, but it wouldn't normally form part of the insurance program itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor Leeper, please. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, so I, I am concerned. I, I have not had an opportunity to come fully to grips with what this report means for the community associations in uh, Kitchissippi. I, I'm not on this committee. I, I hope that a member of this committee will put forward a motion to defer this item until the July meeting. Uh, I, and I would like to hear from staff, if I can, um, what, uh, what the implications of deferring this for a month would be so that we can consult with the associations and community groups that are going to be most affected. Um, colleagues, I, I have a long history in, in my community with, uh, with events that require uh, insurance. 
we at the Hintonburg Community Association, um, I created the Hintonburg 5K. We held the Arts Park Festival, Chris Kringle, a big craft fair. We did the street hockey tournament every year and um, uh, the world famous uh, movie night for dogs. And all of those events uh, close streets, they book city facilities, uh, they book um, uh, our parks and they all require uh, that $2 million of general liability insurance in order for the city to provide the special events permits for those to move ahead. And my question for staff is, um, in this reworking of the insurance program, the HCA has uh, typically taken advantage of the preferential rates that are available through the city to insure itself. Will that be able to continue? Because none of these um, uh, events are, are city events. They're not delivered in partnership with the city. Chair, I'll, I'll answer the, the last question first. Um, the, the, what, what staff are proposing does not change the, the access or the availability of insurance for those types of events. Um, the city still is able to procure insurance um, that provides favorable rates. Um, but it, 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 again, the, the kind of the leveling of the playing field, um, staff didn't go so far, or are not proposing to go so far as to, for example, eliminate the insurance requirements that might apply in the event of a parade um, or some other um, event that goes through, for example, the, the, the special events bylaw or something like that, and those insurance requirements. Um, again, you know, where that is a, a community association, the city may, have, may provide access to um, favorable premiums, um, but that that doesn't get to the the kind of the leveling or the the removal of the inequity between the groups that are providing that ongoing programming, um, whose premiums were were funded by the city and those that weren't that are addressed by this report. So the uh, the Hinsonburg Community Association that provides all this and has uh, typically uh, taken advantage of the city's preferential rates, but which has paid for that insurance themselves, would still be able to get access to those preferential rates through the city. Um, Chair, always again subject to the availability of the insurance itself. So, if for example the insurance industry and the insurance market as a whole determines that. Um, for reasons of risk that it's not prepared to, to ensure fireworks or something like that, there might be limitations. But otherwise, that whatever access they have had has been continued and is unaffected by this. Okay. And then for those groups that have a rink, because I've got a couple of the community associations who offer a bit of community programming, but they also run a rink. Um, is the city going to be paying their premiums? Chair, the, the premiums for rink operators are, are separate and apart. Um, in the last, I do believe, year or two, they have been folded under the city's overall integrated program. So they're no longer provided separately through the what we call the CPIP, the Community Partners Program. Their insurance is funded by the city, and the city essentially extends its own insurance to cover them through the operation of the city rinks. So if they have the winter festival or a, a, a community gardening day, et cetera, is that event covered under the insurance that they have through the rink program? Normally the, the, the rink operation program would cover their, again, that, that covers the operation of their rink. If it were a one-off event or something like that, then that would presumably be a separate, they may require separate insurance for that, again, dependent on the nature of the event the number of attendees, the nature of the activities that are planned and things like that, all of which can affect what the, the, the individual premium might be. Um, though, as I say, it tends to be a nominal amount. Okay, I, I'm concerned that uh, the community groups that are providing a lot of programming that is not being delivered as part of a, of a city mandate um, uh, don't have a good grip on the implications of this report for them. Um, I still don't feel as though I know what the implications would be for the community programming that's offered by a variety of groups in uh, in my ward. Um, I would I would ask um, a member of this committee to put forward a motion to defer this until um, uh, the next FedCo meeting. Okay. I'll leave it there, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Luloff. 
Thank you very much. Um, Mr. White, if this was to, to rise to council uh, on the first, um, the, the first council meeting of June, does that still give you enough time to, to execute the renewal or does it, is this something that has to be, that has to be dealt with today and then rise to the next council? Chair, obviously, you know, staff are in, are in the committee's hands in that regard. Um, the renewal takes place in June. Um, in the event that the, the matter is deferred, there may be, um, there will be an administrative burden um, in that municipal or uh, community associations, community groups that um, might otherwise become eligible in the event that the staff recommendation is approved, might need to secure their own insurance for that period. Um, whether they need to, whether they can do that uh, on the basis of a, like a monthly premium or something like that and refund um, or and have it canceled, that's uh, quite frankly, that's why staff are, are before you today in May to, to ensure that to the extent possible, any changes to the program can be, can be implemented as, as community associations and community groups start going through the application process in anticipation of the June renewal. So Councillor Luloff, we do have a, another council meeting May 25th. Would that uh, give people enough time to bring specific concerns to Mr. White? And Mr. White, is that gets you out of that situation where there's no coverage on June 1st because of the 25th? Certainly, Mr. Mayor, happy to work with, with any members uh, that have specific questions um, and to, to try and address any of those questions or concerns. So Councillor Luloff, uh, would you then I don't know if it's the will of the committee. I, I, I missed part of the debate, unfortunately, but is there a desire maybe that uh, we take this um, offline so that individual councillors can try to deal with specific um, situations in your own wards and then have direct that uh, this item come back to council on the 25th? I think that that would be, that would be entirely so appropriate. Your heads. So I'll, I'll move that we... Um, defer this item uh, to the council meeting of May 25th. And um, in the interim, uh, the onus is on you as individual councillors to go to Mr. White or the appropriate staff to try to get the, the issues answered uh, to the best of their ability. And we'll, we'll debate it at the 25th. Is that agreeable? I think that's entirely Very agreeable. Cool. Members, members, agreed? Okay, so uh, thank you um, for that, Mr. White. And um, again, uh, Colleagues, if you who should they contact, Mr. White? Is it you or someone else specifically, so that members of council know who to contact before the twenty fifth? Mr. Mayor, I would I would simply suggest uh, any any councillors with questions reach out to me, um, and I'll deal with my team and uh, potentially Mr. Chenier's team, and we'll get those questions answered. Okay, Mayor. Yes, Councillor Brockington. Can we still be permitted to ask questions today? Well, we just deferred it, and the whole purpose is to go back and ask questions uh, the, of staff. The, I thought the point of deferral was to allow community associations to digest what's been presented and allow them to communicate with their local councillors. Yeah. No, it's, it's to have councillors go who have received input from their community associations or concerns to bring them to Mr. White. So we just voted on deferral, so we're, we're going to move on. I didn't see a vote, I'm sorry. Well, I asked and uh, it was it was supportive. I understand, so you let six people speak to the item, but the other four that were remaining cannot ask their questions on the record today at FEDCO. Well, uh, because you can ask them, the whole purpose was to take it off side to deal with it. We, we went through this debate in the last five minutes, Councillor. All yeah, right, the, the request so to uh, next to is uh, notices of motion. Time. Sorry, Councillor, we have item. the floor. Notice is a motion for consideration of a subsequent meeting. Um, other business, uh, just to remind people that the FEDCO uh, meeting Mr. on Friday. Mr. Mr. Mayor, it seems the deputy clerk is uh, trying to say something, I think. No, no. no Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, the, our meeting on Friday begins at 9 a.m., deputy clerk. Is that correct? Not 9.30? That is correct, Mr. President. And our next regular meeting would be uh, Tuesday, June 7th. Yes. I think the, the French has a typo in it. It says the, the 6th of May. Apologies for that. Make sure we, that's corrected. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Merci.